Uh, he taught them things that, you know, we still don't learn in schools, in our schools, uh, things like popular economics, income distribution, uh, tax policy, uh, health care policy, uh, all things that are important for if you're, if you're representing workers. So I'm excited to hear from him about labor and democracy today. Greetings and good morning to you all. I'm very happy to be standing with you, this incredible group of activists, as we rise up together. I love that, rise up together to work toward a fairer, safer, and more just world. I look forward to sharing with you some thoughts I have about a sector of our society where rising up is perhaps more necessary now than it has been in uh, decades. Where our history, I believe, proves my point that without a vibrant labor movement, we cannot have a vibrant democracy. If we are ever going to achieve a more lasting international peace, greater economic security for all people, and a society where social justice is the rule, and inequality and hatred are a dim memory of things past, then we as a people need to learn our history better and learn from lessons we were taught. But first, and this is where Jan has already told you a little bit about me, I was going to say uh, uh, a couple of things, of course, that I've lived in the Chicago area my entire life, and I did retire three weeks ago after 34 years with the union. Yeah. But if you do that with AFSCME, Council 31 and the International Union, but if you do the math and add the five years of my life as an educator, teacher, union activist, you'll see that two-thirds of my life, yeah, I'm that young, <laughs> have been as an activist trade unionist. So 66% of my life has been active in the labor movement, among other things. Yeah. I was about to tell you how proud of myself I am for doing that, but you're also telling me that, and thank you very much. <laughs> I know it's a little self-indulgent to go on and on about oneself, but this is a big change of time for me. But uh, I think one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do that makes me so proud about the time that I've worked in the labor movement, a circumstance that not so many people either choose to uh, participate in or have the opportunity, but I'm currently president of the uh, Illinois Labor History Society. and. Uh, I think that, as Jan said, we could argue, and we probably successfully, the most distinguished labor history society anywhere for the many reasons that I'm sure later Stephanie will love to talk about. But I also want to tell you, or I believe, that this biography of mine shares why I'm a kindred spirit of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. When I left college, I actually graduated. I came to work as a teacher, but I also organized a local community group in my town, Oak Park. It was a group we called Citizens for Responsible Energy. Within months, we became the West Suburban Voice for Anti-Nuclear Activism and an advocate of renewable energy sources. We believed in turning swords into plowshares. It is there that I met several women from the League who lived in Oak Park and who were more than happy to dive yet into one more issue that they could embrace. And back then, and I imagine we still see the bumper sticker, arms are for embracing. For me, life has been a weaving, or more aptly put, a quilt of activism through learning and learning through as I learned labor history, I began to see how women and men of courage, young adults and even children, played an individual and collective role in changing society, sometimes in one event, and sometimes over decades, or even generations. I was thinking about this as I've learned our history a little bit better over the years, how sometimes it's not the adults, but it's the children who teach us. And while it's not well known in our history, one of the first strikes in this country, among many in the early 1800s, was a group of children who walked out of a textile mill. I think the year was around 1835, and I believe it was New Jersey. And it was the children who rose up and said, 
We will not allow those 11 and under to work more than 11 hours a day. We are going on strike. And I've always been moved by this idea that these children did not have adults to stand up for them. Obviously, the circumstances, the oppression, the difficulty that adult, you know, the poverty forced people into circumstances, but it took the children to realize that this idea of how unjust and unfair this child labor. And it wasn't to end child labor, it was just to reduce the amount of hours that youngsters had to work. And so that's our history, and that's the world that we constantly are trying to change. So, you know, I have my own history. I, my late teens and 20s were sometimes marred by existential angst. And I began to understand that actions speak louder than words, but words can lead to action. It was through action that I dedicated myself, sometimes with intention and sometimes by accident. Let me read the words from perhaps one of the greatest American women who almost no one today would know. I bet most of you do, but most people wouldn't know who she is. And she, and this is despite the fact that she led a march of poor people in 1915 from Hull House to City Hall, down Halstead Street, just what east of here, with Jane Addams at her side, as they sang the song, Solidarity Forever, for the first time in public. This is a woman who spoke to workers along the banks of the Chicago River as she rode a barge and urged them to organize unions. And she had to do it this way because she was banned from the city of Chicago because of her activism. But the river was governed by interstate commerce interests. Hence, the city couldn't enforce the ban against her. This is a woman who engineered the creation of the most important labor monument in the world, the Haymarket Martyrs Monument in Forest Park, Illinois, for which we are caretaker, deed holder, uh, into perpetuity, as I say. She did this so that the memory of the Haymarket Martyrs would live on into perpetuity after witnessing the barbarism of corporate greed and governmental cooperation and the judicial murder of five innocent men in 1887, including her husband, Albert. They were hanged for their involvement in fighting for the eight-hour day and democracy. This is a woman who addressed the crowd with Mother Jones and Big Bill Haywood and Eugene Debs and others at the founding convention in Chicago of the IWW in 1905. This is a woman who organized an issue on issue after issue until her timely and suspicious death in a Chicago house fire in 1942. You do know who I speak of, of course, our beloved Lucy Parsons. Here are her words, or some words. The idea of less restriction and more liberty and a confiding trust that nature is equal to her work is permeating Modern thought. Of all the delusions, modern delusions, the ballot has certainly been the greatest. The fact is, money and not votes is what rules the people. Passivity while slavery is stealing over us is a crime. And that's the phrase I want to repeat again. Passivity while slavery is stealing over us is a crime. When labor is no longer for sale, society will produce free men and women who will think free, act free, and be free. And so, my friends, this great woman, born a slave with Mexican blood, married to a white ex-Confederate soldier, imagine this, Lucy Gonzalez Parsons spoke directly to me and reminded me why I needed to be in the labor movement. Despite the numerous issues I cared about, this was the place that spoke to me. For me, the labor movement represented the greatest mediating institution in America, where people of every race, color, creed, religion, and ethnicity, social class, and gender could share and collect on the same stage, even more so than the church. I'm not so naive to think that our union institutions do not reflect bigotry and segregation, homophobia and militarism, the pettiness of the human condition, or the corruption inherent in any institution. But the common thread that social justice grows from economic justice was called, and still is. And I'm reminded of it when I look at your fourth check mark on the uh, poster over there. This 
this, as you know, was the message of Dr. Martin Luther King, who was assassinated as he engaged in working with the AFSCME san striking sanitation workers in Memphis in 1968. In the late 1800s, around the world, workers around the world had become conscious of the idea of international solidarity, even before International Labor Day, May 1st, was called for to commemorate the martyrs of Chicago at Haymarket. It is that put, it's that potential, international in scope, that especially intrigued me. Because I guess I felt that if we were going to have world peace, if we were going to have justice, it really needs to be international. It is to this end that the Illinois Labor History Society celebrates May 1st each year at Haymarket Square in Chicago by inviting international labor federations to dedicate a plaque to the new monument erected in 2004. Yes, it took 114 years for uh, the public to get some kind of monument at Haymarket Square, perhaps one of the most important incidences in the modern world. But since 2004, labor federations from Colombia, Sweden, Japan, Iraq, Canada, Mexico, Germany, France, and others have dedicated their plaque, come to celebrate on May Day in Chicago. Workers around the world all too, know all too well that capital and finance is transnational, and for the first time in our history, the world has become small enough that what happens in China can have immediate impact in Nigeria. What happens in the European Union affects Brazil. Disney was right. It's a small, small world after all. <laughs> And now the world is small enough that workers, if so inclined, could change the course of history of the world in ways only imagined 150 years ago. It's a fact, however, that all politics is local, too. And it is on the local front that we can have immediate success. That is why I fought for democracy in Oak Park just three weeks ago when our village trustees tried to opt out of the new Cook County Ordinance calling for a new minimum wage law that was going into effect the next day. They waited eight months, and then the day before the law was going into effect, they decided to try and opt out. My town, my liberal progressive town. 200 of my fellow citizens showed up at the village hall and forced our democratically elected trustees to call off that vote. That we provide low wage workers of a higher minimum wage in five sick days. We won, my friends, we won because we took to the streets, literally, and ended up at Village Hall. We pointed out to the village trustees that having a rainbow flag behind them in that boardroom was hypocritical to Oak Park values if you also choose to deny the workers, its workers basic human dignity, like a living wage. I say enough of those limousine liberals, don't you? <laughs> you see, my friends, matters around economic justice are the kinds of issues that could bring us together. More importantly, they are the issues that express much about how democracy can work. What greater laboratory is there for teaching democracy than to engage in workplace advocacy where most of us spend most of our waking time? Until we free ourselves from wage slavery, which is what Lucy was trying to say in that little speech I read. Most of us will be dominated by bosses who employ us at will with no voice unless we have a union contract. Makes me think right now Jeff Sessions is wondering how he might get a union. <laughs> unless we have a union contract and enforce it, we will have little input into the working conditions and pay and benefits that determine much of our well-being. Just as important, however, is that unions provide opportunity for average citizens to learn leadership skills, advocacy, organizing, and civic duty. This is what happened in Memphis in 1968 and inspired millions. Dr. King connected the dots for us from Selma to Memphis to Vietnam. We know that union members vote at a significantly higher rate than almost any sector of society, despite representing now only 12% of the workforce, or in 2008 it was about 
Union rep members represented over 26% of the voting population, and this trend continues to be consistent. Unions teach us how to be involved when a union operates as it's supposed to. Union members are more likely than non-union members, non-union workers, to act as volunteers. Isn't the mark of civil society and democracy one made up of volunteerism and mutual aid and support? There is a stereotype of your average union worker being a white construction or factory worker. At times they are a changing, my friends. Today, nearly half of all unionists are women, and minorities represent a greater proportion of the labor movement than ever before. Today's unionist is likely to be a teacher or graduate student or home health care worker. In my union, ask me a convention looks like America, doesn't it, Jim? White correctional officers sitting next to a Hispanic social worker and an African-American librarian talking to each other. This is what today's union looks like in so many cases. It is at the bargaining table, in conventions, in union meetings, where people learn to argue and debate in civil discourse most of the time, <laughs> and educate each other about the concerns of their particular struggles. Where else in society does, di does this take place in one room? I'm going, I'm not going to suggest that the iron workers look exactly like this, but today, women in the trades and minority caucuses have pushed unions to speak to the concerns of workplace segregation and inequality. In other words, union members actually do the walking not just the talking. My fear, however, is that we have made strides over the years to democratize our workplaces, but the forces of evil, some call it capital, have successfully destroyed much of organized labor and created roadblocks to make it virtually impossible to organize a union in a private sector workplace. Donald Trump just nominated two white wingers to vacancies on the National Labor Relations Board, which will adversely affect labor rights for years to come. And it seems to me that we all have a stake in labor rights. Moreover, the public sector is now on the chopping block as well. Most likely in 2018, the new Supreme Court will rule in favor of the Koch brothers and the National Right to Work Committee through Illinois Governor Rauner's case coming before them that public sector unions will no longer be able to compel non-members to pay their fair share of union fees despite the union requiring the union to represent them. Now, you know, this is called right to work, which is perhaps one of the most insidious terms in America today. This effort to starve the beast has paid off for the right wing in Wisconsin, as you know. Wisconsin, my friends, is going national in 2018. The question is, what can we do about it? We know that dictators hate unions. They always have. Need I discuss Nazi Germany or any of the other dictatorships that purge or subordinate unions in order to suppress the population? Conversely, look to the most to most of the democratic style governments that have developed more recently around the world, and you will see strong and influential labor movements. What happened in South Korea and South Africa provide great examples. Like him or not, Winston Churchill properly stated, democracy is the worst form of government except for all others. So if you lived in Colombia in the 1980s and 90s, being executed was the punishment for being a union member or activist. If you, are an act if you are an activist trying to win democracy in the Philippines, you are likely a unionist. And if you were part of the Arab Spring several years back, you were most likely a union member. We are on the precipice of losing a huge part of our democracy when we don't allow workers to organize. Let me quote a former AFL-CIO operative, Phil Fishman, giving him credit here. He said, trade unions produce a unique synergy of economic and political benefits. On the economic side, they ensure that workers gain a fair share of the income their work produces. The, thus, strong unions reduce stark in inequalities within a country. 
A more equitable income distribution contributes to poverty reduction and by increasing consumer demand stimulates greater economic growth. On the political side, trade unions make major contributions to producing more vibrant civil societies. Isn't that what we want? They encourage workers to participate in the political process, negotiate with other interest groups, and act as a check on government authority. Unions keep governments accountable by ensuring the concerns of working people are represented not only in the workplace, but in the public debate. They advance the social cohesion vital to democracy by bridging ethnic, religious, racial, and gender divisions. So thank you, Mr. Fishman, for those words. I believe that when we lose collective bargaining rights, when we lose the right to organize, we reduce activism, we reduce the ability to debate that a democracy requires. Perhaps it makes more sense to you now, if you didn't already consider this, why the wealthy, the right wing, want to end the right to unions in America. It is interesting to see how the Chicago Teachers Union has become the voice for students' needs of the Chicago public schools. While corporate media, right-wing politicians, and think tanks like the Illinois Policy Institute claim public sector workers are special interests, promoting only higher taxes on an already overtaxed population, code for racism. It is the union representing child welfare workers in Illinois that promotes better services for the most vulnerable in our society. It is the home health care unions that advocate for the needs of the population they serve. It is the union representing workers in a direct care facility taking care of the developmentally disabled that advocate for increased staffing and equipment. This is my direct and personal experience, contrary to the claims of the corporate defenders. The frontline workers in a union can advocate for their clients, unlike those workers, who are not represented by a union because their contract provides them the protection to advocate. This, my friends, is democracy and action on a daily basis. Now I would like to return to Lucy Parsons again for a moment and her great words that inspire me every time I read them. She claims that passivity while slavery is stealing over us is a crime. I do not know exactly when those words were written, but since it would have been after slavery, slavery was abolished, I'm convinced she was talking about the new world of industrial slavery, not nearly as cruel as chattel slavery, but imagery of workers in chains during this new epoch of industrialized civilization was not unusual. Lucy, born of a slave family, understood the degradation of work when you sold your labor and got nothing in return beyond just enough to survive. Hence, workers were wage slaves, and a new social order would have to be created where people no longer work for wages, but for the mutual benefit of each other, which in turn would provide every need and want and subsequent freedom. The only way to end this degradation and gain freedom was through action. Otherwise, one would be aiding and abetting in a criminal act. This idea that passivity in the face of injustice is criminal may seem a bit hyperbolic, but then again, maybe not. Methinks Lucy wants people to engage in action, and a democracy requires such. As I bring this to a close, I have one story from an experience that I want to share that has informed my thinking for nearly the last 20 years. I was giving a labor history bus tour, and we ended up at the Haymarket Martyrs Monument in Forest Park at the cemetery. It was our last stop. Two young men came up to me, not from this tour, but they came from another direction and they were being escorted by a Methodist minister I know, maybe some of you know, the Reverend Dan Dale. They both spoke Spanish, and of course I didn't understand, 
and they were gesturing to something that I was holding that they wanted. I had little note cards that, just for reference purposes. And I asked Reverend Dan what it is they were saying and wanted, and he said, they were about to be granted sanctuary in his church as they had just fled Columbia. They were trade unions and faced execution if they stayed. I asked again, what were they doing here? And what did they want? They were asking for something. Reverend Dan said the first place they wanted to come, in Amer come to America was to visit the Haymarket Cemetery to honor the martyrs. He said they wanted a piece of paper because they wanted a memento of this place, something. I was speechless and my heart grew full. And I finally realized 20 years into my career, the value of fighting for a better world. Something that I talked about, told people about, but never had to experience personally like these young men would be executed if they stayed in their country. History therefore teaches us that an educated citizenry, often led by courageous individuals, working in coalition can change the course of history. Think New Deal. Think women's suffrage. Think abolition of slavery. Think end of child labor. Think end of Vietnam War. Think Colombian trade unionists. Civil society, rule of law, democracy in the workplace, social and economic equality, and basic respect for human life. These are the characteristics I want to live in. A world that I want to live in. And the world I will continue to fight for. And that's why I'm so proud to be with you today. So, join Jamie Adams and Lucy Parsons as they march down Hubblestead Street for workers' rights, for democracy, for a better world, as they say these words, which I will not sing, I cannot do it, but just everybody stand, please. If you know, if you have a mic and you want to start the song, you know Labor's National Anthem. For the union. 